that's the beginning of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which is just so gorgeous. I love it. We'll talk more about Moonlight Sonata in a little bit, but first we need to talk about the life of Beethoven. He's one of the most important piano composers, and he fits into our timeline today in chapter three, bridging from the classical era to the romantic era. In chapter two, you'll remember, we were talking about classical style piano sonatas. We focused on Mozart a little bit, and Beethoven was born in that time. And I want you to know that the composers before Beethoven were equally wonderful and genius and innovative, but Beethoven did new things that really opened doors for the next generation of composers that no one else really did. So I'll explain what I mean by that. Beethoven was born in 1770, and his early compositions were really fitting in the classical world. He wrote piano sonatas, he wrote um, symphonies, and it was fitting into the traditional forms and harmonies and standard lengths of pieces, you know. And it wasn't until his middle and later periods that we see Beethoven doing some new and creative things with the piano as an instrument. At this point in history, when we're getting, you know, later in the 1700s, the piano is no longer just a new invention. Now it is a standard instrument that is being built and sold and bought throughout Europe and even America. And Beethoven was doing his concerts on piano, not harpsichord or earlier instruments. So it was still an early version of the piano, but it was truly a piano. Beethoven's compositions are divided into an early period, middle period, late period. And it's that middle time where we get some of the greatest pieces that, that are most well known, like this. Elise was written around 1810. Uh, later today, we're talking about Moonlight Sonata. That's early 1800s as well. There's a piece that you'll know, but it's not a piano piece. That's the opening to the Fifth Symphony, and everyone will recognize that, okay? In the middle of Beethoven's life, so we're talking about early 1800s, he was playing concerts. He was a concert pianist. He was teaching piano students. He was traveling. He was gaining fame and fortune with his writing. And then as we get into the later part of his life, all of that changes. And as Beethoven lost his hearing, his career path changed. He was not doing concerts. He was not traveling. And he changed his focus to composing. And I think there's a misunderstanding when people think about Beethoven, they think of grouchy, moody, old man who doesn't talk to anyone. And while that's true, sadly, at the end of his life, the rest of his life was very vibrant. And, and you know, we, we put him in this box of a withdrawn composer, and there's so much more that informs his compositions, which is his ability to play the piano, his ability to conduct, his, his knowledge of instruments and orchestras. So there's a very well-rounded um, approach to his writing. And as we get into those later years and we see the compositions get longer, more difficult, um, and more expressive too, those compositions are referred to as visionary and they were ahead of their time. And Beethoven truly is a genius in this way. What he was writing, you know, in the 1820s wasn't even really appreciated until decades later. It was that next generation of composers into the 1800s that really finally caught up with what he was trying to do, not just with the piano, but with orchestra, with choir. One of his more famous themes from the end of his life is this one. You recognize that, okay? And it's known as Ode to Joy or the famous theme from the Ninth Symphony. This was almost at the end of his life is when it was written, but what a huge, magnificent work. As we look at the whole scope of Beethoven's life and his writing and his work, we see that transition from classical to romantic, 
in, in his style and in his use of the instrument, we see 32 amazing piano sonatas that you must know. These are referred to as the New Testament of piano writing. If you think all the way back to Bach in chapter one, we talked about his well-tempered clavier as the Old Testament. Here we are with Beethoven, the New Testament, just meaning that it's all there. It uses the instrument in, in many, many ways and expressively gives us a wide range of options and moods and techniques that we can use on the instrument. Um, Beethoven really opens the door for the Romantic era composers coming up in the 1800s. I really don't think they could have done what they did expressively, musically, if Beethoven hadn't set the stage for that. That's the beginning of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which is just so gorgeous. I love it. And we've talked about Beethoven bridging from classical to romantic as far as styles in music history. And I really think we're seeing some of that here. Uh, this was written in the early 1800s, so it's not quite that later visionary part of his compositional life. But still with this piece, if you think about what came before it in music history, we talked about composers writing for churches or um, the royal court for a king's banquet or wedding or something coming up, um, or even for a city event. And these bigger event type of musics with a function, this piece is different. It's more small, internal, reflective. It's to be played in a home, it's to be played for yourself or for a, a loved one or a small group. Um, of course, it's a concert piece now, but I think the mood of it is so different from what came before. Um, and this is one of those reasons why Beethoven opens the door for future generations of composers, because it's about expression. It's about personalizing the music and writing it for yourself. So this piece, I think goes there a little bit. We're in this very moody minor key, C sharp minor. I think when you're studying this piece, the first thing to do is understand that key. There are four sharps to keep in mind. You can learn the scale and the chords and do a little warming up in the key of C sharp minor just for your ear, for your fingers. That's where we're gonna begin. In our technique portion of this chapter, we talked about opening the hand shape opening to these bigger octaves. Look at the left hand. What about broken chords in the right hand, covering that octave when it comes up? So remember, alignment. Remember, it's not about working hard and holding tension, but finding a way to make that easy and balanced. That's where you're gonna get this beautiful, open, rich tone, which we really want in this piece. A couple musical aspects here that, again, kind of a new thing around the 1800s. It's very quiet. It's sustained in the tempo. It's not, it's, um, not speedy fast or anything. So that's part of creating the mood. As we begin, I think even the fact that those harmonies are so drawn out I think that's part of the mood too. We're not changing chords rapidly or anything like that. Work to get the right hand very smooth and very subtle. I want you to check something here. When you begin playing, are you able to play your thumb without striking it on the key? Are you able to just use your motion in your arm and wrist 
to depress the key without any extra energy being thrown in there. This is actually something I've seen with this piece. That's why I'm bringing it up. When you set your hand on that first broken chord, be careful that your thumb does not go. That's a different style of playing. What we want is a really, I think of subtle, I think of staying close to the keys, small. Check that out. Use your ear, use your, your technique to manage what you're doing. Pedal can also help. But when the pedal is down, it's a bit easier to feel that blend and, and the motion into the notes. That's important. And we go through, we go through a few measures with the same idea. Sustained, setting the, the atmosphere. About measure five, here we go. Now, a minute ago, I said the thumb should be subtle and small and close to the keys and no extra motion. Do the opposite of that when you get to pinky finger when the melody comes in. Yes, add that extra strike. Let's hear that starting note. So when you have control of your technique, you have this palette of colors, so to speak, with what you can do on the keys. The challenge there, of course, is that you're doing both within one hand. My pinky finger is gonna strike and bring that out. My thumb is gonna stay close, small. Okay, that's gonna take some practice. I would try each one separately and then start putting it together. Do you remember in our technique lesson when we did pinky finger and then a light thumb? There you go. So that's the same feeling. Why don't you practice that on a G sharp so that you're prepared for this moment? Do you hear it? That's part of the magic of this is the layers of what Beethoven does and how he knows how to use the piano. He was a pianist. Okay, that matters, doesn't it? One last thing is that pedal is important. We do want to pedal this. Use your right foot on the damper pedal. And every time there's a chord change, you must change the pedal. So from measure one to measure two, that would be a pedal change. Measure three. And each time that we get a new harmony, I think you can kind of follow that. The pedal must be cleared so that we don't get too muddy of a sound. Um, if you would like to try left foot on the soft pedal, that works in this as well. That gives us a more muted, quieter sound. So left foot on the soft pedal, not a stupid question. Some people ask me, do we need to change this one? Do we do anything? Nope, you just put it down. As long as you want that quiet sound, you hold it down. It works independently of the damper pedal, so we can use our right foot normally while we're holding the soft pedal down. When you want the sound to open up, lift it and, and we'll get a new sound color there. This is a piece that you can live with and grow with and appreciate for years. And it really leads us in to the 1800s, the Romantic era in piano music. And we're gonna talk about this more in chapter four, but Beethoven opened the door for these next composers, middle of the 1800s, piano composers, some of the greatest works. And I'm gonna share that with you next time.